Toft, Whitney, all of them have undergone the odd ritual of initiation. All have spilled their darkest secrets. All have been ritually humiliated in front of their peers. And all of them owe loyalty to the Order. It is estimated that there are some 800 bonesmen alive today. Around half of them active and in key positions in the American economy and political establishment. There are plenty of reasons to be shocked just by what we have learned so far. This is a secret society founded by an alleged drug lord that counts among its members people who have financed the Nazis. Their members meet in a bunker supposedly full of stolen skeletons, and among its brethren we find no less than the president of the most powerful country on earth, and also his main political contender. And Skull and Bones is not the only secret society that appears to be pulling the strings of world power. There are at least two other organizations who are suspected of foul play, ranging from economic manipulation to attempting to achieve world control. They are the Bilderberg Group and the mysterious Council of Foreign Relations. Skull and Bones has seen its power grow steadily since its foundation in 1832. In spite of its alleged early links to drug trafficking and Nazism, most of its known members are respected, influential politicians and businessmen. But Skull and Bones is not the only secret society whose influence reaches the highest ranks of power. There are more. One of the organizations most suspected of pulling the strings of world power behind the facade of an altruistic organization is the CFR, or Council on Foreign Relations. They're also hidden away here in Washington, D.C., on the seventh floor of this building. They define themselves as a non-partisan resource for information and analysis. That is to say, an innocent think tank. But are they what they say they are? The answer to this question may hold the key to understanding the true origin of many events that happen to us every day and seem to be a result of our own free will. The Council of Foreign Relations was founded during the First World War when a university fraternity presented President Woodrow Wilson with a set of proposals that detailed options to reinforce world democracy when Kaiser Wilhelm II was eventually defeated. The proposals were backed by Colonel Edward Mandel House, advisor to President Wilson. Wilson presented the project to Congress in January 1918, where it was approved. And the CFR was officially founded in 1921. Its first sponsors were members of the most powerful families in the US. Rockefeller, Mellon, Harriman, Schiff, Kuhn, Lowe, and Carnegie. It was also backed by important foreign citizens, including multi-millionaire South African colonizer Sir Cecil Rhodes and European bankers Warburg and Rothschild. The CFR makes no secret of who their members are or their activities. At least that's how it seems. Its headquarters are on Park Avenue and 68th Street in New York City. Its reports can be freely downloaded from the internet where the CFR publishes a full web page at www.cfr.org. It runs a newspaper that is the most prestigious political analysis journal in the United States, Foreign Affairs. It seems they have nothing to hide. However, its critics say that it's nothing more than a facade, that the CFR is a dangerous organization set on achieving full global control through the levers of economy and finance. In other words, they're like executives out to privatize world power. According to its critics, the domination strategy of the CFR is to control both sides of conflicts. And its ultimate goal, the creation of a private world government that would run countries as corporations. To achieve this, it would first have to erode the political structures of all sovereign states. Then it would have to foster worldwide socio-cultural standardization 
And finally, it would have to impose a globalized financial system that it could control. Critics add that all of this would be achieved by provoking global conflicts that would keep the masses united against real or imaginary common enemies. Any similarity with reality is surely pure coincidence. But can an organization, no matter how hard it tries to manipulate the world, actually achieve this? If so, how much power would it need to amass? To be allowed to join the select 4,200 members the CFR has today, it is mandatory to be American, or to be about to obtain American citizenship. The council is loaded with top executives of financial institutions, powerful industry leaders, and mass media executives. Academics and scholars, high-ranking military personnel, politicians, public officers, deans of universities, and research centers are also welcome. Their reports identify threats, opportunities, strengths, and weaknesses and then offer operational, tactical, and strategic planning in all the spheres of interest to the United States. The question is, is this for the better or worse? The list of its most prominent members is a conspiracy theorist's dream come true. Among CFR's most renowned members are David Rockefeller, Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Hungarian-American billionaire, George Soros, Supreme Court Judge Stephen Breyer, Low CBS Network's President Lawrence A. Tisch, former U.S. Secretary of State General Colin Powell, General Electric's former Chairman and CEO Jack Welch, current U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, W. Thomas Johnson, President of CNN, and Catherine Graham, President of the Washington Post, Newsweek, International Herald Tribune Group. That's not to mention Alan Welsh Dulles, founding father of the CIA, and banker Paul Moritz Warburg, who was born in Germany and emigrated to the United States, where in 1913 he drew up and promoted the legislation that would create the Federal Reserve Bank. This is the American Central Bank, whose capital is not public as would normally be expected, but is instead in the hands of private banks. The Federal Reserve is not the only institution related to the CFR. The International Monetary Fund behind me and the World Bank close by were both created by CFR members. These three organizations control most of the world's capital, as well as distribution and aid policies. That is to say, they decide who wins and who loses. Both the IMF and the World Bank have come in for some heavy criticism over many years for their lousy management of world crises. When instead of acting like last resort moneylenders, as their mission states, they became involved in dictating the macroeconomic policies of deeply indebted nations, drowning them in more and more debt. This policy had catastrophic results for countries such as Brazil, Argentina, Turkey and Mexico. Joseph Stiglitz, Nobel laureate for economics, has repeatedly attacked the performance of the fund, suggesting that it was the true cause of many of the aforementioned crises. This cannot be brushed off as hearsay, since Stiglitz was chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank from 1997 to 2000. In other words, an insider. If we observe how the price of medical supplies generates gigantic profits for those who produce them and at the same time kill millions of people who cannot afford to buy them, if we stop to think about the irreparable damage that multinational corporations carry out in the so-called third world countries, if we study the mechanisms of usurious loans of the world banking system that cyclically provoke crises that sink entire countries below the poverty line, it's worth asking. Is economic war more effective than conventional war when it comes to achieving world power? Are the members of the CFR those responsible for carrying it out? 
or is it all nothing but a natural byproduct of the capitalist system? The idea of a world dominated by private corporations, led by the CFR, might sound nonsensical. These corporations have a joint turnover that is almost twice the GDP of the United States and employ more than 25 million people in the United States alone. Their power is surely already strong enough to twist some political arms worldwide. Perhaps the CFR is just an innocent think tank, like its members say it is. One thing is certain, the undeniable and enormous power wielded by such a group of influential people, for better, or for worse. What are the secret societies pull the strings? Or better said, what are the societies secretly pull the strings on the world stage? Most experts agree that one of the traits of contemporary secret societies is that they're no longer guided by ideology, but rather by pure and simple economics. In practice, this means that they use their influence in the corporate world to force entire countries to serve their interests. The average person is completely unaware of how national strategic decisions are taken. And whatever changes his vote may bring about happen only over the very long term and usually prove to be merely cosmetic. If there's one secret society that has every characteristic needed to raise suspicion, it's the Bilderberg Group. Surely the most exclusive club on the planet and perhaps the organization that really controls the world. The Bilderberg Group is named after the Bilderberg Hotel in Osterbeek, Holland where it first met. Its founders were Joseph Rettinger, a Polish emigre with social democratic ideas, and Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. The annual meetings that it has held since then have been regarded as true milestones in international politics. For the occasion, each country sends two guests, one of whom is conservative, the other liberal. According to Prince Bernhard, the group was created as an entity destined to fortify the North Atlantic unit, to stop Soviet expansionism, and to promote cooperation and the economic development of the countries of the West. Sometimes to better understand an organization, you need to know more about the people who work for it. There are two interesting facts that question the integrity of the founder of the Bilderberg Group. Firstly, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands was an active member of Hitler's SS in his youth. Second, he had to stop heading the meetings in 1976 after being involved in the Lockheed scandal related to the purchase of fighter jets. On that occasion, Lockheed was found to have bribed Japanese, Dutch and Italian officers. The Nazi background of Prince Bernhard did not stop the Bilderberg Group from being supported by Social Democrats, or by the Rothschild Bank, or the Rockefellers, both of Jewish origin. Other early sponsors included the Wallenbergs, owners of Electrolux and Ericsson in Sweden. All of them still actively participate in the annual general meetings of the group, either directly or through their representatives. The only thing that this confirms is that when it comes to making decisions that will affect the world, ideology doesn't really play that much of a role. After all, business is business. The venue, the agenda and the participants are not secret. What remains undisclosed, however, are the topics discussed, since the meeting is held behind closed doors and no detailed reports are published. The conference takes place during a weekend in May. 